Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this afternoon's uh, event, uh, Political Implications of Ireland's Deepening Economic Relationship with China. Uh, I'm Nathan Hill, and I'm director of the Trinity Center for Asian Studies, uh, which is also home uh, to the MPhil uh, in uh, Chinese Studies. Uh, and if you don't yet have a master's degree in Chinese studies, you might uh, consider it, especially if you are stimulated by today's uh, discussion. Uh, and um, it's our pleasure to be hosting uh, this, this, this panel discussion today. And um, I will now uh, introduce uh, Connor McGlynn, who, who uh, at the, the uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars in Washington, uh, DC. Connor is also a, um, uh, an alumnus of Trinity, uh, and he'll say a little bit more about himself. Uh, but uh, the point uh, that I just want to mention is that, that uh, the Wilson Center and Trinity have, have uh, co-organized this event, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, he has put in a lot of uh, work in doing that, and I just want to extend my gratitude to him uh, for that. And, um, and having said that, then I'll just uh, turn over to Connor and he'll introduce also uh, the other uh, panelists who will, be, who will be speaking this afternoon. So thank you uh, for, for coming. I hope you uh, enjoy the discussion and, and then I'll just turn over to Connor now. Thank you very much, Nathan. And thank you all for tuning in today. As Nathan said, this discussion is co-hosted by Trinity Center for Asian Studies and by the Wilson Center. Within the Wilson Center, it is co-sponsored by the Kissinger Institute and the Global Europe Program. To introduce today's discussion, I'll say a few words about how this event came about and what we were hoping to achieve. This is, to the best of my knowledge, one of the first public discussions of its kind on the Ireland-China relationship. My own interest in this topic comes from seeing this relationship develop from a number of different perspectives over the past few years. I did my undergraduate studies at Trinity College Dublin before working in EU technology policy in Brussels. I moved from there to Beijing, where I studied as a Schwarzman Scholar at Tsinghua University. I'm now a Schwarzman Fellow here at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC, where I'm working on competition in international standard setting for emerging technologies. During these past few years, Ireland's economic relationship with China has deepened significantly. Chinese investment in Ireland has jumped by 56% in 2019, even as it fell in Europe as a whole. The value of Irish exports to China grew from less than 4 billion in 2016 to more than 11 billion in 2020, making China Ireland's third largest non-EU trading partner. This bilateral economic relationship has developed in the context of changing attitudes to China in both Europe and the United States. Since the start of the pandemic in particular, transatlantic sentiment has become more aligned and the relationship with China more fraught. While the benefits of closer economic ties with China may be significant, this geopolitical environment raises questions about how Ireland navigates this bilateral relationship. The aim of this event today is to facilitate a discussion of these questions, connecting the Irish relationship with China to the global conversation about China's rise. What does it mean for Ireland to pursue deep, deeper economic ties with China in the current global environment? What has been the experience of other countries in a similar position? And what can decision makers in Ireland learn from them? And how does Ireland's status as EU member state impact its bilateral relationship with China? We are lucky today to have an impressive panel to reckon with these questions. These are Tim Moore, the Regional Director for Asia Pacific at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Yvonne Murray, a journalist at RTE, Jamil Anderlini, the Asia Editor at the Financial Times, and Finbar Birmingham, the Europe Correspondent at the South China Morning Post. I'd invite our panelists to provide some remarks for 10 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the Zoom Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. I'd also invite you to include your name and institutional affiliation with your question. However, if anyone prefers to ask their question anonymously, that's fine as well. We will try to get through as many as we can. But to begin, I'm happy to turn over first to Tim Moore. Tim is the Regional Director for Asia Pacific at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, and he is also the incoming ambassador to Australia. Tim, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Connor. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning uh, if you're uh, in East Coast. 
Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to, to talk with you today. And thanks to, to Connor uh, and to Nathan and to Lorna at Trinity and the Wilson Centre for giving me this, this opportunity. I'm also looking forward to hearing from the other panellists uh, what they have to say and also interacting with everybody else uh, on board as well. By way of introduction, uh, I am currently the director in our Asia Pacific unit, which oversees the department's engagement with countries in Asia Pacific, which includes China, uh, but also everywhere from Pakistan to New Zealand, and including, um, well, we're not sure whether we include the Antarctic or, or not in that. Um, I should also clarify that I'm speaking on my own behalf today and not on behalf of the department or on, certainly not on behalf of the minister. And it might be useful, given that this is somewhat of an inaugural conversation, to just maybe give a few words of context about the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, from my engagement with other foreign ministries down the years, I think we're not much different from, from the mainstream. Um, our mission is defined as to serve the Irish people, promote their values and advance their prosperity and in interests abroad, and to provide the government with the capabilities, analysis and influence uh, to ensure that Ireland derives the maximum benefit from all areas of its external engagement. That and, and much more is, is on our website. But what is not there is an organogram, uh, but not for any secret reasons. We have a fairly rational structure. And I think for the purposes of today's discussion, I just point out that we have a number of geographic units, such as Asia Pacific, Latin America, and so forth. Uh, we have policy divisions, such as EU, EU affairs and political, as well as a number of thematic units, such as human rights and disarmament. And we work hard in our individual areas to try and bring cohesion and coordination between the particularly between the geographic and the thematic. We try to marry the geographic focus of the Asia Pacific unit with the thematic expertise of say, say human rights or, or sustainable development. And we work closely with our missions in the region um, and also with Asia Pacific missions uh, assigned to Ireland. And we contribute to an Asia Pacific perspective, our contribute an Asia Pacific perspective uh, to broader policy development. Um, our basic approach can be seen in our Asia Pacific strategy, uh, which dates from early last year before COVID, uh, where we set out our vision for Ireland in the Asia Pacific region as being Ireland being recognised as a trusted and valued bilateral and EU political and economic partner for countries in a more prosperous and more stable Asia Pacific region. And this is a cross government approach uh, outside of DFA. There are international sections in most government departments, uh, as well as a number of state bodies focusing on international engagement, such as Enterprise Ireland, IDA, Borbia, and so forth. In addition, we have a growing number of embassies and consulates worldwide, including 15 in Asia Pacific, uh, soon become 16 when we open in Manila, uh, and we have major operations in Brussels and New York. And again, we work hard in our unit to try and bring together cohesion and coordination between home and abroad. So how does this machinery operate when it comes to China and what are we trying to achieve? Um, the Connors intro today, you know, speaks of our attempt to balance economic and political considerations. Uh, and and that, that's true, and it's not wrong, but it might be more comprehensive or more correct to say, we're trying to manage a relationship with China that operates at many levels. Uh, there is, of course, economic and political, but also people to people connections and development and culture and, and so many more. And they operate at a bilateral level, uh, Ireland, China. They operate at an EU China level um, and they operate in a broader UN level, um, such as at UN itself and very many other international organizations. And, and our job in our unit is to try and manage all these elements um, according to their own rhythm and specificities but also in tandem with relations with, let's say, EU and, and, and also US, sometimes as part of a shared approach to the same question, and sometimes as part of a wider set of relations. These are not discrete items. They, they, they overlap and they interleave and interweave, uh, which means that it's very difficult to take an all or nothing approach to some particular issue or to compartmentalize issues uh, in relations to, to China which is not the same thing as saying, oh, everything is very complicated and very fuzzy. Uh, it's not, um, but almost everything is connected. Uh, and it is important to understand the implications of what you're doing, uh, preferably before you do it. And again, I don't think this is a uniquely Irish approach and it's not confined to relations with China. Um, at an EU level, I think relations with China were, were very well defined in 2019 in a joint communication where the EU said, that China is simultaneously, and I think the simultaneous is important, 
China is simultaneously in different policy areas, a cooperation partner with whom the EU has closely aligned objectives, a negotiating partner with whom the EU needs to find a balance of interests, an economic competitor uh, in the pursuit of technological leadership, and a systemic rival promoting alternative models of governance. From our perspective uh, in Ireland, we found that rings, that rang true, it rings true, um, and is in line with what Connor was suggesting is that there's a more clear eyed approach these days to relations with China. But I also see echoes of that in President Biden's speech to the State Department in February uh, when he said that from the US perspective, we'll also take on directly the challenges posed to our prosperity, security, and democratic values by a more serious competitor, China. We'll confront China's economic abuses, counter its aggressive coercive action, push back in China's attack on human rights, intellectual property, and global governance. But we are ready to work with Beijing when it's in America's interest to do so. We will compete, that word again, from a position of strength by building back better at home, working with our allies and partners, renewing our role in international institutions, and reclaiming our credibility and, and moral authority. In the last couple of days, I saw an interesting article by Professor Shin Kawashima of Tokyo University, uh, in which he crystallizes President Biden's uh, approach, saying that the US will take a tough stance on cutting edge dual use technologies, but cooperate in space development. Uh, it will confront China on the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, but cooperate with China on North, on North Korea and on DPRK. Both of these formulations, you know, they have different emphasis, um, but they do attempt, both attempt to present the complexity of a relationship uh, that is evolving all the time. Uh, and again, not so much to balance things, but to manage relationships with China as simultaneously, in our case, a partner, competitor, and, and rival. And I think in addition to the geographic and the thematic, uh, we also have to take time into account. Um, I've been in this job just short of four years, and in that period, uh, our relationship with China has evolved considerably and become more complex. Uh, on a bilateral level, the range of issues we tackle, whether it is technological or commercial or diplomatic or, or consular, have grown and grown. Um, and the pendulum uh, has swung more towards challenge and away from opportunity, <coughs> and certainly away from simple and strongly towards complex. And any exuberant illusions that the Irish system may have had about a Chinese El Dorado, I think they're largely toned down at this stage. But there are still many positive engagements with China across the spectrum, and they're built on a more realistic platform. Likewise, at the multilateral level, uh, whether it is EU-China or in broader UN fora, the challenge of a more powerful and influential China is there for all to see. And while China can legitimately seek to shape international policies, standards, and organizations to suit itself. We, Ireland, the EU, and, and like-minded, we can also legitimately push back and defend our interests and values as we see fit. And um, in some ways, that's what multilateralism is all about. And maybe another development is that in the last number of years, I'm seeing more and more that relations with China are no longer a matter of bilateral concern, whether it is Ireland, China, or, or EU, China, the influence of China is now global. And in our relations with other countries and regions, the topic of China is frequently now included in agendas. <coughs> Excuse me. Can we make progress on Myanmar or DPRK without China? I don't think so. Can we fix climate change without China? I don't think so. Where is technology going? How do we improve supply chains? How do we implement the sustainable development goals? What's the future of the Irish dairy industry? And many more questions. All of them have a, a Chinese dimension, not always the top dimension, but an important dimension. And, and for Ireland and for the department, we're working within that complex multiplayer environment. Uh, and we seek to protect and project our interests and our values to the extent that we can. On an operational level, this means analyzing the merits of each issue that emerges or that we wish to introduce. It means trying to understand the Chinese perspective. It means taking into account the perspectives of others, EU and beyond. And then often working with like-minded countries, it means seeking to find a way forward in a manner that is effective and, and fits our overall strategy. And in doing so, a key challenge is trying to keep a degree of coordination across all the players here in Ireland. States are not monoliths. Um, and in Ireland, at least, 
we don't have a centralized command and control mechanism for foreign policy. Good idea, though. Uh, however, an advantage of a smaller system, such as Ireland's, is that messages can be transmitted and absorbed fairly quickly. And there is a general like-mindedness, which most of the time is a good idea, but not always a, a good thing. But at bottom, I think our focus is and should remain not on making choices between A and B or making binary decisions uh, or even dodging choices, uh, but on managing our relationships as, as holistically as we can uh, with China in whichever forum uh, in an open and forthright manner. And that's why events like today are, are very helpful. Um, I think they help us ventilate discussions with a broader group of participants uh, and allow us to share perspectives with others uh, that can help us as we continue to tackle the many aspects of our relationship with China. I might leave it there and happy to take questions by and by. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Tim, for those comments. Um, our next panelist today is Yvonne Murray. Yvonne is a journalist with RTE who has lived in and reported from China for a long, for a long time. She is currently based in Taiwan. And Yvonne, over to you. Thanks, Connor. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so today, Connor asked me to, to look a little bit at the Chinese perspective on Ireland. So I'm going to um, uh, make a stab at, at answering that question. Um, and I think what I have to say will probably echo a lot what, what Tim has just said. Um, but first, I'll talk a little bit about my perceptions, um, about the perceptions I encountered in China of Ireland um, over the decade or so of living there. And then I'm going to move on to some of the, the more thorny economic and political issues uh, that Tim touched on. So uh, most people I encountered had just about heard of Ireland, um, but I would say they struggled to find it on a map. Um, in conversations, people often can confuse it with Holland. Uh, I'd be asked if it was part of England. Uh, some people had heard of the situation in Northern Ireland, for example, um, but only quite vaguely. Um, my favorite conversations in China were with people who asked me about the population of Ireland. And when I told them there were about 5 million people, people would laugh out loud and uh, how small that was. They marveled at how such a small place could be an independent sovereign nation. And they were kind of really impressed that such a small country could make um, such, uh, you know, such, such an international impact. Um, throughout those conversations, I'd say the feeling towards Ireland was really very warm. Um, if I asked people what kind of an image they had of the country, they'd say green grass, clean air, you know, images that conjured up the wild Atlantic way, um, happy cows in lush fields. Um, some people referenced river dance, more rarely James Joyce. And I'd say that these perceptions were largely derived um, a lot from TV and films. Um, but also I would say that the Irish mission in China has really punched above its weight in terms of shaping China's impression of Ireland in a positive way, building those cultural ties and business ties um, that Tim was, was talking about. And, and as we've seen, this is translated into a kind of massive upswing in Irish exports to China, um, Ireland being one of the few countries to run a trade surplus. Meanwhile, looking from the other direction, Chinese companies want to invest in sectors that in Ireland that are of strategic interest to China's e economic upgrade that it's undergoing at the moment. This made in China 2025 strategy, it's about shifting from low skilled manufacturing, you know, what made China the factory of the world to more high skilled innovation driven sectors like AI, software, robotics. So there's huge interest in Ireland's innovation industries, uh, life sciences, FinTech, Agritech, green tech, all of those things. And obviously something that's also got a lot, lot of press coverage recently, there's, there's a rising number of high net worth individuals in China investing in Ireland, uh, receiving Irish residency in return. But politically, uh, and more, more recently, I would say, the Chinese leadership has begun to see the value of Ireland as a gateway to Europe. Obviously, this is partly because of Brexit. But Ireland's uh, importance to China's strategic interest globally has also grown as relations with other countries have begun to sour over issues of uh, trade, as we saw throughout the Trump years, um, and human rights, particularly the mass incarceration of Uyghurs, other ethnic minority, minorities in Xinjiang, repression in Hong Kong. And this is where it gets complicated. Um, 
so it was, it was clear to me as a reporter in China that during this the boom years, um, the business community was very pointedly steering clear of politics. You're not going to ask me about human rights, business people would say to me ahead of interviews. Um, diplomats would often say, Ireland doesn't do megaphone diplomacy, which meant they would keep quiet in public about sensitive issues, but uh, they say that they would raise them behind closed doors. Um, and this worked for many years. And, you know, this is not unique to Ireland. This is what a lot of countries were doing in China and making a lot of money out of the Chinese market. And it was against the backdrop of this dominant narrative in Washington, London and Brussels, uh, which was that economic engagement uh, would bring China into the international fo fold and it would eventually lead to political liberalization inside China. So people were a bit kind of starry eyed about this unbreakable bond between capitalism and democracy. Well, of course, as we know, that turned out to be entirely false. China went the other way. It's now this very wealthy, very influential and very authoritarian superpower. And it's presenting a, an aggressive challenge to the international community over what have long been considered universal values, protection of individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, rule of law, independent courts. China's now saying with increasing confidence in international fora um, that these aren't universal values, they're Western values led by America. They don't necessarily fit China's development model. So instead, China's having, it's pushing to have its alter, alternative authoritarian model of governance at least respected. And I think eventually given equal weight in international institutions. So it's through this prism that China views criticism of its policies uh, in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Um, in Xinjiang, it's facing allegations of genocide against the, the Uyghur people. And it's why, despite being a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other agreements, it rejects what it sees as interference in its own internal affairs. Uh, it sees all of this as a, as a, a US-led imperialist plot to contain China and to stop its rise. Um, and this has led to an angry regime lashing out, not least attacking the journalists and the researchers who brought evidence um, of, of this situation, particularly in Xinjiang, the mass incarceration there, um, to, brought that evidence to light. Uh, some of you may know our departure from China was as a result of the pressure on us from the Chinese authorities, um, specifically targeted uh, against my husband over his work for the BBC on Xinjiang. Um, as well as investigations into the origins of the coronavirus. Um, but it was the Chinese sanctions on European researchers and individual MEPs, which led to the China-EU investment agreement being shelved. And there's clearly some consternation in Beijing now about the repercussions of that. Perhaps some acknowledgement that that uh, aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy that, that you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has become synonymous with recently has damaged China's image overseas. Not that there's much sign of that being toned down, but um, you know, as, 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 as Tim was saying here uh, a, a minute ago, what Beijing sees now is this growing international consensus, that that division in the Atlantic Alliance, which was damaged during the Trump years, is being repaired by Biden. This is troubling to Beijing. So China is out looking for friends to build its support base, and this is where Ireland comes in. So, um, Simon Coveney's visit uh, two weeks ago now uh, to meet Wang Yi in Guiyang is seen in some circles as an attempt by China to use the periphery to take the core. Um, it's certainly interesting that several other EU countries were invited, but they declined. So Ireland ended up going alongside Hungary, which has been such a friend to China over the years that it's frequently vetoed EU statements, notably one in support of the protesters uh, in Hong Kong. And I would say um, this visit certainly de de delivered a, a propaganda victory for China, uh, with state media portraying Ireland as an example of a country which respects China's differences. In other words, one that's not going to openly criticize what it's doing in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. And in the, in the Chinese coverage, um, notably, there was no mention of the ongoing detention of uh, an Irish citizen, the aviation executive Richard O'Halloran, who's been held without charge in Shanghai for more than two years. A situation, as we know, that has sent uh, shockwaves through the China-Ireland business community.
But there was reference in the, in the Chinese state media to the commitment by both sides to deepen ties in several industries. And one of those industries was aviation. But if you speak to people in aviation in Ireland, you, you'll, you'll know that the atmosphere has darkened considerably because of o, O'Halloran's detention. And there's, um, there's a feeling that the Irish government is powerless to get him out, despite their friendship and this pragmatic foreign policy and the lack of megaphone diplomacy. And um, this makes people feel uh, vulnerable in their dealings with China, it certainly has an impact on whether business people will be willing to travel um, to a country which openly engages in the arbitrary detention of foreign nationals. So I think the question for Ireland, and the question we're trying to answer today, is how it can act as a bridge between China and Europe, or as a consensus builder in the UN, when China, as part of the terms of, the, of its friendships with other countries, will demand silence over issues of concern to the international community, issues which are core to Ireland's foreign policy. Now, small countries like Ireland will know the criticism of what China considers its internal affairs will lead to retaliation from Beijing. Small countries, particularly vulnerable. Uh, trade is frequently weaponized to punish countries that step out of line. Look what happened to Norway uh, when, when the Nobel Peace Prize was, was uh, awarded to the democracy advocate, uh, Liu Xiaobo. Salmon imports were cut overnight into China. Look more recently at, at Australia's treatment when they called for an independent investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. They've been slapped with very punishing trade tariffs. And of course, the more your economy is integrated with China's, the more painful that retaliation will be. Meanwhile, on the home front back in Ireland, uh, antipathy towards the Chinese government, partly because of the pandemic, partly over the treatment of the Uyghurs, and also because of the detention, the ongoing detention of Richard O'Halloran, um, uh, antipathy is growing. The Irish paper, The Journal, uh, carried out a poll recently. It showed that 84% of Irish people deeply distrusted the Chinese government. So I think the, the challenge that the, uh, that the Irish government is, is facing, trying to navigate this new global order in an increasingly polarized world, um, is really very, very difficult. I think China, uh, I think Ireland is going to have to uh, choose between this hardening international consensus, which includes Irish uh, public opinion, which is very wedded to core values like, like human rights. Um, so choose between that on the one hand and its friendship with China on the other. And I, 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 think, I think we have to be practical about the fact that China does, will expect a choice at some point. We've seen it already with international firms operating in China where they either have to accept that they're going to use Xinjiang cotton, which is, has been linked to forced labor, uh, or they lose out on the Chinese market. These are some of the kinds of decisions that, that other countries and other companies will face. So having spent the past 10 years in this region, uh, watching China's rise from a front row seat, I think that these really are um, some of the challenges that, that uh, the, the rise of China has been posing. Um, I don't think that there are any easy answers. I think, you know, as a journalist, my job is to observe this and, and, to, and to pose the questions. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to, to people in government to come up with solutions, but I think that the, the problems and the challenges are, are certainly extensive. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Our third panelist today is Jamil Anderlini. Jamil is the Asia editor at the Financial Times. He has extensive experience reporting on China, but he's also from New Zealand, a country that is also managing a complex economic and political relationship with China, another small country that is often uh, overshadowed by a larger neighbor. Um, and I asked if he'd come on today to talk a little bit about the New Zealand experience with a kind of view to what Ireland might learn from it. Um, Jamil, over to you. Thank you very much, Connor, and thank you for having me. And uh, it's good to see Yvonne. I'm sorry you had to, um, you had to leave and go to Taiwan, but uh, Taiwan's a nice place. So I hope I really hope you're uh, enjoying it there. Um, so yeah, uh, Connor wanted me, thank God, wanted me to talk about New Zealand and not about Ireland, because my I would have had to do a lot of homework um, uh, to, to say anything of any sort of mild intelligence on, on Irish, uh, Sino-Irish relations. But New Zealand is where I um, 
mostly grew up. Um, I've spent more time in, in China than I have in New Zealand actually these days, but um, I follow it quite closely and we even report on uh, Sino uh, New Zealand relations sometimes. So the way I look at it uh, in many ways, New Zealand is a bellwether uh, and a cautionary tale, I would say for small open liberal uh, democracies like Ireland, which are impacted by the global rise of China. Um, New Zealand, I think, is regarded these days by both China and its closest traditional allies as the soft underbelly of the Five Eyes intelligence grouping and a weak link in the Western alliance. Um, it's also regularly held up in Chinese state media by, the, by the, um, uh, the Communist Party in China as a model of how to kowtow to Beijing it regularly. I mean, literally uh, on a regular basis, you have headlines saying, uh, do like New Zealand does, isn't it wonderful? So when you look at um, Ireland's role in Europe and in relation to the UK, I think there is a similar, there is a similar dynamic. I mean, the same size of population, um, but also Ireland is seen, I think in many ways as a bit of a backdoor to Europe and, and to the UK, especially after following Brexit. Now, New Zealand's, um, policy, the, the current government uh, likes to talk about a values-based independent foreign policy. Um, in my opinion, that is rank hypocrisy. In fact, what New Zealand has these days is a vassal state policy towards China and a milk powder sales policy. That's effectively, if you look at what, uh, um, at what New Zealand's doing, in my opinion, that's, that's how you could sum it up. It's become a really thorny political problem actually quite recently for the New Zealand government because the position of the government and actually most politicians, this isn't a party specific thing, this is all the, almost all the politicians in, in parliament in New Zealand, their position on China is quite different now from key allies such as the US, traditional allies, the United States, Australia, even the UK and Canada. And it's quite different, as Yvonne was alluding to, I think, in the Irish case, it's very, very different from the position of public opinion. Uh, public opinion in New Zealand is uh, relatively anti-American, but it's also very, um, it's very pro-human rights. Uh, I also agree with Yvonne that this is going, this problem for the New Zealand government is going to get much worse because, uh, and, and I think Tim alluded to it a little bit too, this idea of choices between A and B, these are gonna be forced, they are being forced on countries like New Zealand, like Ireland. Uh, and Tim mentioned, you know, Ireland's not trying to dodge these questions. Well, the New Zealand government is absolutely trying to dodge these questions. The New Zealand uh, prime minister and the New Zealand foreign minister refuse to even accept interviews on the topic of China. Uh, the only time they speak about it and they still get themselves sort of tied up in knots and, and in a bit of trouble is at very stage managed public events. Um, I'm also uh, reliably informed that the New Zealand government and New Zealand ministers before they give any sort of public statement about China will show the statement to the Chinese embassy beforehand, which I think is uh, personally a, an infringement on sovereignty of a sovereign government uh, and seems a sort of amazing to me. Um, early, at an earlier stage, New Zealand's approach to New Zealand a few years ago, I would say was characterized by, uh, this is the place of the government and probably the general population, a combination of ignorance, naivety and greed. That's really the sort of way to describe the, the approach towards, uh, towards China. Um, now it's one of overwhelming fear, actually, thanks in large part to the punishment that Australia has received uh, for introducing foreign interference laws, uh, banning Huawei from its critical infrastructure, standing by its main ally, the United States, and calling for an independent investigation into the origins of, of the pandemic. It's quite interesting because Australia, actually, when you look at its trade statistics, latest statistics show that it sends for, around 40% of its exports to China. So it's the most uh, trade dependent on China than uh, of any country. Um, uh, however, most of those exports, the bulk of that ex those exports are iron ore and other raw materials that China just cannot shut off and can't get elsewhere. So Australia is in this fascinating situation where it's been, where it's been effectively, it's been sanctioned, economically sanctioned, trade sanctions have been placed on it by China, but its trade with China has gone up 33% in the first few months because the price of iron ore is soaring and uh, China needs 
uh, because of its um, economic model needs a huge amount of iron ore to make steel and build stuff. So New Zealand uh, exports about twice as much to China as it does to its second largest uh, China's its biggest uh, export market. Um, its second largest export market is Australia, and China exports about twice as much to China as it does to Australia. But it's uh, China only accounts for about a quarter of of New Zealand's goods and services exports. However, uh, and like Ireland, New Zealand does have a, a big trade surplus with with China. But um, however, the big difference is that what everything that New Zealand sells to China, China can get from somewhere else. It's uh, milk. It's beef, uh, it's, it's meat and it's timber and it's things like this. So New Zealand is actually in a much more difficult position today than Australia is because it has the, it sells smaller volumes, obviously, than, than Australia and things that, New Ze uh, that China can get anywhere else or well, many other places. Um, now the New Zealand government uh, is in a position where they're trying very hard, actually, to uh, diversify trade dependence away from China. It's actually uh, official government policy. There are other countries that are trying very hard to still sell stuff. New Zealand is in a position of trying to tell its companies, hey, sell to Indonesia, sell to Japan, sell to Europe and, and North America. So uh, I, when you think through, when I think through how New Zealand got to this point, I would say that um, successive governments really didn't think about China, only a little bit when it came to sort of trade promotion. Uh, New Zealand has vanishingly few China experts in the government or in the foreign ministry or in the whole country, frankly. So there's never there hasn't been much of a focus on this. I think the, the most studied language in New Zealand by far is French. Chinese comes in at about fourth or fifth, and it's still minuscule numbers. So people study French and Spanish and Japanese and German, and uh, almost nobody's studies Chinese. Um, when it comes to the security and intelligence uh, community, which I think now is very, very, very focused today on China as their top priority now. But um, up until only a couple of years ago, they were, as in the rest of the West, they were overwhelmingly concerned with terrorist threats they thought were emanating from the Middle East, even though New Zealand was uh, basically not affected at all by that. But that was very much as a because of the overwhelming focus of the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangement, uh, that was New Zealand's main focus, uh, trying to find um, uh, people with names like mine in New Zealand who might, uh, who might uh, end up being um, uh, homegrown terrorists. Uh, so there was this very strong desire to take advantage of Chinese growth. Um, and then a desire by the main political parties to tap into a the, the voting power of a growing Chinese diaspora. So um, at, at a certain point, a, a little over a decade ago, both main political parties in New Zealand allowed or welcomed manifestly problematic people into the core of their, of their parties. Um, this included a naturalized New Zealand citizen who worked for 15 years inside the Chinese military intelligence apparatus. Uh, he lied about this on uh, about this fact on his immigration applications to New Zealand. Uh, once he was in New Zealand and once he became a member of parliament for the National Party, he maintained extremely strong links to the Communist Party of China and the Chinese uh, uh, embassy. Um, he also relentlessly cheerleaded for the Communist Party from inside the New Zealand parliament. And uh, he was at one point on the Select Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defense and Trade, despite the fact he spent 15 years inside uh, the Chinese military intelligence uh, system. Uh, his background only came to light after the Financial Times and a New Zealand media company called Newsroom reported on, on his background. Um, and eventually, quietly, it's come to light since that quietly, uh, just before the last election last year, him and uh, uh, someone with a similar um, not quite as egregious background um, from the Labour Party were both quietly asked um, by their parties to step down prior to the last election last year um, because of recommendations from New Zealand's intelligence services uh, saying these people are, have, are problematic according to reporting in New Zealand. So uh, the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party for its own reasons has really ramped up its influence and interference operations um, in Western countries in recent years. Uh, the way I would characterize it is the Communist Party of China is not starting from the position of, say, the Soviet Union 
uh, the, the way the Soviet Union was in, in deciding it wants to spread its ideology around the world. That's not really the modus operandi or, or the sort of motivating factor for, for the Communist Party in China, but it is definitely trying to wake, make the world safe for Chinese autocracy. Um, and it, uh, if you listen to Xi Jinping um, on a regular basis, he's identified, and the Communist Party have identified universal liberal values as their most important enemy. Uh, and they now, I think it's quite clear, are trying to take this fight against their main enemy, global. Uh, you have the United Front Work Department, which is very powerful and very influential and very uh, alive and, and um, active around the world. Um, and I think this, this sort of these influence and interference operations really began initially in trying to uh, influence the, the diaspora in particular. So uh, the Communist Party of China remembers uh, history quite well, uh, especially revolutionary history. And they know that Lenin, Sun Yat-sen, Ho Chi Minh, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, all of these people uh, were sort of formed in the diaspora communities, uh, these exile communities, and they brought revolution back home. So Beijing is really trying, or initially their attempts of sort of uh, operating in places like New Zealand and Australia, we're really trying to just sort of quiet and, and control a bit the diaspora communities there so they didn't sort of reinfect uh, uh, China itself. Um, but I think as in you know many multinational com companies, I think in Ireland you get something similar, but in, in Australia, New Zealand especially, uh, many multinational companies will start a marketing campaign or, or launch a new product in like in New Zealand because it's an English speaking small market, low, low investment overheads, and you can then see if it works there. And if it works, you can roll it out to America or, or UK or Canada or Australia. I think in a very similar way, China has uh, sort of tested out some of its um, influence operations in, in New Zealand. Um, and seeing what's uh, having a look at what works. So for example, most sort of influential former politicians in New Zealand are on boards of Chinese state banks. Um, many diplomats have positions that are well-paid and basically sinecures. Um, these people are then, of course, incentivized to at the very least say nothing about bad about China or uh, critical of uh, the Communist Party's actions in New Zealand or elsewhere. And, uh, uh, you know, at worst, they're sort of encouraged very much to say very nice things. Um, uh, I won't get too into it, but you know there are huge, in the context of New Zealand, political contributions to all major parties uh, that have been given by uh, Ministry of State Security and United Front Work Department cutouts. You know, quite well documented and quite shocking, actually, in the scale. Um, lots of cooperation. Uh, so the other problem we have in the West, in general, is media is very weak and getting weaker. Um, and in the case of New Zealand, it's extremely weak and extremely desperate for cash. And uh, in many cases, they've had they've set up cooperation agreements with Chinese state media um, and also taken huge amounts of advertising for from state uh, controlled Chinese companies. Um, so now we're in a position that when you, the New Zealand government is actually publicly repudiating its most important and longest standing allies. Uh, it's, it's distancing itself from the Five Eyes arrangement, from uh, it's lecturing Australia about being more diplomatic and nice and friendly and quiet about uh, and towards China and uh, finger wagging at America, which is a bit harder since Trump has gone, but you know, uh, and also going great lengths not to say anything that might offend Beijing because it's scared of being punished. Uh, the very last thing I'll say is uh, I want to give a little shout out to a Wilson Center fellow, a woman called Anne Marie Brady, who is uh, one of the top global experts in the phenomenon of uh, Chinese external propaganda, influence operations around the world, uh, polar issues and various other things and um, news i would say that the only one well the only reason actually we have some visibility in into the extent of some of these uh trial programs that um the united front work department of the communist party has been uh, uh floating in new zealand the only reason we know about this is because of Anne marie brady's amazing work um she uh, just happened to be in New Zealand, despite being a global expert in these topics, and she's from New Zealand. I think New Zealand's extremely, extremely lucky to have her. But at the time she started raising these issues and drawing attention to them, she was vilified, ignored, scorned by New Zealand, by the elites, by the establishment. And I think more worrying 
to my mind is that not every country most countries, many countries will not have someone who is uh, such a global authority on these particular issues and brave enough to sort of uh, come out and and uh, and draw attention to these because the personal cost is, uh, you know, for someone like her are quite high. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jamil. The final member of our panel today is Finbar Birmingham. Finbar is the Europe correspondent at the South China Morning Post. He has reported for quite a number of years from Hong Kong and has just moved to Brussels, I believe, two weeks ago. So we're glad you are over your jet lag and can join us here today. Thanks, Connor. Uh, thanks to the three panelists, three great presentations there. Um, look, um, I'll talk a wee bit about um, the EU-China relationship and my observations of that and where do I see Ireland fitting in with that. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that over the last 18 months, we've seen a, an absolute um, nosedive in the EU-China relationship, uh, sort of coinc coinciding, I would say, with the pandemic. Um, not surprisingly, obviously, the, the origins of the virus itself, but also China's mass diplomacy behaviour didn't go down very well in large parts of Europe. Um, at the same time, you've got all the long-standing issues that um, I think Amory mentioned with uh, China's economic model, trade and investment stuff, um, which have been huge issues down the years. But um, the human rights issues coming out of China, the, the persecution of Uyghurs in, in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in Xinjiang, and obviously the crackdown on um, democracy movement in, in Hong Kong. All of this has served to really um, install a pretty, pretty dark sentiment towards China in Europe. Um, and I think it's, it's far behind the United States, but it's certainly um, moved the needle. And I would say that particularly in the last six months, we've seen a, a real deterioration. Um, if you think back like uh, December 30th, um, so six months ago almost, um, you had um, Xi Jinping, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, uh, EU leaders, uh, Michel and von der Leyen, all on this video call, uh, concluding the EU-China Investment Summit. It was a great photo opportunity, all smiles and all the rhetoric was about how this is a, a new sort of a chapter for EU-China collaboration and so on. Um, it didn't go down too well in, in large parts of Europe, but it was done, as I said, under the shadow of all of these sort of human rights issues, uh, the consternation that individual member states have with, with China's sort of behaviour. Um, and the EU simply wasn't able to sell this. Um, MEPs kicked up a massive fuss and the EU was under uh, I think huge pressure to balance this by showing that it did actually um, have something to say about human rights as well. So we saw in March um, these low level targeted sanctions on Chinese officials for their role in uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, um, which were immediately and furiously retaliated uh, against by, uh, by China with um, really deep uh, cutting sanctions against MEPs, some of the more vocal MEPs on China, in fact, in the parliament, not surprisingly. Um, diplomats, the entire political security uh, committee at the at the EU got sanctioned, um, and, and you know the, the effect of this was to to scupper the deal. Um, to uh, the MEPs kicked up another fuss and, and voted it, uh, in Parliament voted to to refuse to debate it and to even discuss this deal while the sanctions remain in place. And of course, China is not going to remove these sanctions on EU uh, people while you know while this is all going on. So. Well, what we've got to at the moment is um, a situation that's drastically different even than six months ago. This week uh, here in Brussels, um, uh, well, next week, actually, we're going to have Joe Biden in town for the EU-US summit. Uh, he's going to be in the UK this weekend for the uh, G7 summit, and then there's a NATO summit on Monday. And China's going to be at the, the heart of all of these discussions. Um, so from signing a deal with uh, or concluding a deal with China at the end of December, the EU now is expected this week to come out uh, and, and support this move that, uh, that the, the guys mentioned to call for an independent investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. And that to me is a bit of a sort of a sea change. It won't go down too well in Beijing for sure. Uh, you know, as, we, as, as, as the other panelists said, this was one of the reasons why um, Beijing lashed out on Australia because they... Uh, they put their head above the parapet and they asked for this investigation. Um, and so where does Ireland fit in with this? I mean, based on, on, I mean, what everybody else has said this as well, Ireland seems very content to fly beneath the radar, as do many uh, 
small nations when they're dealing with China. Um, and if you think of Ireland in the context of other European countries, it certainly is far behind on its sort of journey with China uh, than say even comparably sized countries in, in the European Union. Um, some of the supposed agitators, you would say, are those who really maintain and, and, and support tougher lines on China, the likes of some of the Scandinavian countries. Yesterday, we saw Finland release this new government um, action plan to, to sort of try and take a tougher line on human rights and on economic coercion and so on, um, intelligence issues, security issues with China. Um, the Baltic nations, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, have for some time now been to the forefront of calling for a harder line on, on China within the European Union. Um, but when you look at the um, their sort of how they their, their, their relationship and how they, how they sort of view China, I think, um, you know, from how I see it is, is very different to Ireland. I mean, Ireland does seem to be very much on the periphery of things. Um, whereas if you speak to officials and um, diplomats and um, academics and so on in, in the Baltic nations, for example, they always talk about the long shadow of the, the sort of Soviet Union, staunchly anti-communist. Um, you know, they, they obviously are still living in the shadow of Russia. Um, you know, Ireland obviously hasn't had to deal with these things. It doesn't have the same levels of suspicion to what I, from, from what I can see towards, um, towards the Chinese regime. Um, obviously the journal poll that I think Yvonne mentioned maybe, maybe cast some doubt or maybe the things are starting to change certainly at the, uh, on the public level. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, and China has obviously been um, courting these Eastern Europe, Central Eastern European countries for some years. Um, you know, this, this uh, 17 plus one grouping, which was established, I think about eight years ago, was uh, seen as a way for China to, you know, pump money into these Eastern European countries, invest in their infrastructure, um, boost trade. Um, it was seen in Brussels as a way of peeling off uh, other European Union members, divide and conquer as often the way that it was, it was put. But, you know, China didn't deliver on its economic uh, promises there. Um, and so the, a lot of these Eastern European countries, particularly the Balkan, the Baltics rather are seen, they're, they're very disillusioned. They've got this sort of promise fatigue with what Beijing said it would do and it hasn't done. Um, and so Ireland again hasn't really had this level of engagement from what I, you know, my, my, you know, it hasn't really, obviously, you know, you've heard about how China sees Ireland as a back door and so on, but it hasn't had this, um, doesn't seem to have been on this extent of a journey as parts of, of the European Union. And I was actually surprised um, to see, you know, uh, earlier in the year there was um, this instance where Huawei was um, accused of interfering with uh, academics work at UCD, um, complaining to the government over critical articles. Um, and this for me was one of the first instances which I'd heard sort of of a, a Huawei scandal, so to speak, in Ireland. And it was surprising because all around Europe, you've had these sort of uh, wave of court cases, wave of governments trying to ban Chinese technology companies for fear over like, you know, backdoor access for the government and security risks. But Ireland just doesn't seem to be on that, uh, as far along on that journey. So that again was sort of telling to me, um, you know, the calculus in Ireland certainly seems to be, uh, from what I can see, don't rock the boat, don't put your head above the parapet, largely, actually broadly reflective of, um, you know, long-standing EU policy. Um, EU positions are sort of, uh, you know, wanting to have strategic autonomy, not really get dragged along in the US, uh, Trumpians, now Biden's uh, route of uh, going hard on China, although I think they're finding it a bit harder to, to say no to the US at the moment. Um, an example, obviously, the, the guys talked about the, the Minister Coveney's um, visit to China um, a couple of weeks ago to Guiyang, and this was, uh, I think, sort of an example of, um, you know, the, the, the desire to maintain this relationship. Um, you know, when I was speaking to a few people, they said, well, you know, Ireland is um, uh, part of the UN Security Council now uh, for the next two years. It's chairing uh, in, in September. It was fair enough, you know, obviously a, a, a country of Ireland's scale with those political considerations maybe doesn't want to turn down the opportunity to have face time with Wang Yi. Um, However, like I mean, as, as as has been said, that the optics were were pretty awful, you know, to be uh, to be on this sort of um, uh, trip, uh, whether or not they were at the same time, but in the same period as Serbia, Hungary, Poland, 
four authoritarian leaning uh, nations in Europe who have very co ties, cozy ties with Beijing. And as Yvonne says, this was seized upon by the state media and Ireland was sort of portrayed as, you know, one of our four friends in, in, in Europe alongside these guys, which I don't think, you know, anyone in Ireland really would want to see. Um, and this, I think there was no real, um, uh, certainly no coincidence that this happened in the mouth of um, the diplomatic flurry that I mentioned, the G7, the NATO summit, um, you know, the EU-US um, uh, summit. You know, when China generally is, is feels like it's under siege like this, it does sort of go on a bit of a charm offensive. In the same week, we saw, uh, you know, Chinese ministers speak with Mario Draghi, with the Spanish leadership, uh, Yang Jicho, the uh, Wang Yi's boss, was in Croatia. So it seems like Ireland was sort of sucked into this charm offensive, um, willingly or wittingly or unwittingly, I, I don't know, uh, this pattern of outreach which China does seem to, to embark on. Um, so, you know, if, if, we're, if we're looking to, to where it might go in terms of EU-China, we, we've already said that the EU is certainly on a, um, on, a, on a different course than it was a couple of years ago. Um, it may change further. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of big elections over the next year. The German election in September, we'll see uh, farewell to Angela Merkel, who for many years has been the, the sponsor, the chief sponsor really of close ties between China uh, and, and the European Union. Um, it looks like there's gonna be, be big changes. The Green Party, if you look at the most recent polls would, would be the minority partner in a coalition with the CDU, but whether the minority or whether they're the majority, they will certainly insist on human rights issues, on uh, environmental issues, uh, taking a, a, a you know, more primary role, perhaps at the expense of the com commercial considerations. This might be something Ireland has to, to think about as well. If, if Ireland is sort of, tagged on to the EU center ground or the main, you know, um, the, the mainstream EU, um, in EU policy towards China, if that's going to change over the next couple of years, then it may well be that Ireland is sort of pulled along with it. Uh, we've got French elections next year, um, Hungarian elections, which, you know, uh, if you look at the latest polls, Orban is actually trailing behind the unified candidate, obviously, as has been said on, on the call already, uh, Hungary is the best friend of of uh, uh, China and Europe. And, uh, you know, this has really sort of blown up in Orban's face over the past few weeks with big protests against uh, Chinese university campus in Budapest and so on. Um, so look, um, the needle may well move on China. Uh, will Ireland, um, you know, still attempt to maintain this? You know, we, I don't know, uh, we, we, we'll see. Um, as, as the guys said, there does seem to be a bit of a backlash, um, these issues around, uh, when I speak to actually the odd time I speak with TD senators, MEPs, and so on, they do say that their sort of constituents mention China far more than they used to. Uh, they raise Xinjiang, they raise Hong Kong. Um, you know, obviously the detention of Richard O'Halloran has been huge in the Irish media. Um, the Huawei UCD stuff has been big. There's been sort of UCC uh, Xinjiang issue a few, few months ago as well. So look, I, I think um, the direction of travel in Europe is, is quite clear. Um, things won't be the same as they have been. Um, you know, Ireland as a sort of, you know, as a member of the European Union, I don't see that it can sort of stand against that tide, but I guess we'll, we'll see more about that later in the year with these elections and so on. Great. Thank you very much, Finbar. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, they were very enlightening comments. Um, we're now going to start the Q&A section. So again, if anyone wishes to ask a question, please use the Q&A button. You can see it at the bottom of your screen there. But we've had a few questions come in already. And to start off, I will hand it to Tim. There's a question here, Tim, about the um, what do you think of Ireland's relationship to China within the UN Security Council? And I'd also invite you, if you wish, to um, respond to any of the points any of the other panelists made. Um, please go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. Um, certainly very interesting inputs. Hang on one second, I just killed the Q&A. Uh, I can see what I'm doing. Um, and each individual item, you know, mentioned by each of those speakers, yeah, there's validity in it all. Um, and certainly if you look at direction of travel, uh, I think that that's well recognized. Um, you ask about the Security Council in particular, um, and it is important for Ireland. I mean, 
China is a permanent member of the Security Council. They're there all the time. Ireland participates in the Security Council um, every 20 years, <clears throat> if we're lucky. Um, it'll be 20 years before we stand for election again. Uh, and it is important to us, important to us as an item of foreign policy. It's important to us as an item of national identity that Ireland stands uh, with the P5 and with the other member states uh, in the United Nations and stands up for Irish uh, political interests and, and values. And China is an important part of that. Um, there's quite a few mentions during from the other speakers about the minister's visit to, to Guy Yang, um, which was an important opportunity uh, for the minister to have, as you call it, face time with, with Wang Yi on important Security Council issues, not stuff necessarily happening in September, although there's a little bit of that, uh, but issues that are current in life today. Um, in the same period that he was speaking with Wang Yi, he also spoke with all the other P5 uh, foreign ministers, foreign secretaries, uh, and so forth. So it's as part of an ongoing program. Um, and certainly you could interpret <clears throat> the company being kept uh, in Giyang as being a little bit uh, unusual. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, <clears throat> the arrangements made by the Chinese for visits at the moment uh, are largely driven by COVID. Uh, Minister Wang Yi has to serve time in, well, A, no visitors can go to Beijing. Uh, B, Minister Wang Yi has to spend five days in quarantine after uh, hosting any foreign visitor. Uh, so from a very pragmatic approach, they organize a series of visits uh, uh, one after the other. Uh, no coordination, no collaboration, no, no contact whatsoever uh, between the four different countries who visited. Ireland visited for its reasons, uh, largely uh, Security Council, but also some bilateral matters, uh, some of which were hinted at there, um, but also to talk about EU-China relations. And certainly, if you read the uh, Chinese press release after the meeting, you'd think, oh, nobody mentioned Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Uh, but for in terms of engagement uh, with the Chinese, absolutely, the Irish side were raising these issues. And this goes back a little bit to um, maybe some of the other points raised, raised by the, the, the other panelists uh, about how loud should Ireland be and how frequent should Ireland be speaking on issues of values. And there's a, there's a question of judgment on this. Um, I think if you look at the um, debates in the Human Rights Council, in the General Assembly, even in the Oireachtas, um, there is frequent uh, discussion, debate, uh, uh, on Xinjiang, Hong Kong in particular, and uh, not the only issues, but it does do in particular, and particularly over the last, let's say, 18 months, two years, uh, where Ireland is very forthright in how it sees things happening um, in both places. Uh, statements have been issued by the minister on other occasions. All of these things, we, we say our piece. Um, we say our piece in line with what you would expect from a country like ours, uh, and we say it directly to the Chinese, and we say it in multilateral fora. And this is what we think is the way to, to tackle these issues. Um, the, the term megaphone diplomacy is sort of uh, thrown about quite a bit, uh, often by the Chinese saying they deplore megaphone diplomacy, um, and that's their perspective. Uh, when it comes to multilateral engagements, uh, and Ireland speaking out at the Human Rights Council, either individually or as part of an EU group or as part of a wider group, uh, that's, we don't consider that megaphone diplomacy. That is Ireland saying its piece in a forum that is where it's designed uh, to discuss issues of this nature. Um, but I, I wouldn't like to get hung up on particular issues or topics and so forth. Um, I found the statements from the other colleagues uh, very interesting. And a factor to bear in mind here, I think, is a question of time. Uh, there are changes of approaches, changes of attitudes happening. Um, and I don't think you could point to a particular date when it happened. I think it predates COVID. Um, if you even go back to what I mentioned there about the EU perspective, uh, from 2019, which you know, represents all the member states, uh, it predates that a little bit, that uh, some of the clouds are getting a little bit cloudier uh, than they have been, uh, and the EU is getting a little bit smarter than it has been, a little bit sharper than it has been, uh, but has to bear in mind where it sits in the world as well. Uh, and here, changes from the US perspective uh, are more likely to be impacting going forward uh, in terms of how we continue to manage, and I come back to that word time and time again, how we manage the relationship uh, between Ireland and the EU uh, and China, Ireland, the EU, and US, and, and everybody else. But I'm happy for others to join this conversation too. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, 
I'll next go to Yvonne and Finbar. Uh, Jamil raised an important point about the ecosystem in New Zealand. And you mentioned there was a, really, a lack of a kind of China studies focused ecosystem in the New Zealand policy world. And we have a question that picks up on that point is, does Ireland have an ecosystem of China experts of the sort that Jamil said New Zealand lacks? Are Irish scholars, think tankers, journalists, activists, industry leaders, and government officials in regular contact with each other to discuss management of Ireland-China relations? So Yvonne Finbar is two people who are obviously from Ireland and very deep in this area. I'd be curious to hear what you think of Ireland's ecosystem compared to other countries that you have, as you're aware of, and yeah, what, what do you think of the Ireland-China ecosystem? So Yvonne, I might start with you. Also, if you want to respond to any of the other comments that were made in the panel, please feel free. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, I don't think this is unique to Ireland. I think it's, I think it's the case, it's certainly throughout Europe. It's almost like China becoming a superpower snuck up on everybody, even though people had been predicting it for years. When it did happen, people were completely unprepared. And I think that speaks to the ecosystem. And th there's definitely a severe lack of China expertise. Um, in, in Ireland, certainly in my industry, uh, in um, uh, perhaps in academia, I'm, I'm less in touch with that. Um, and it was always surprising spending time in China and then going, going home. And I, I, again, I don't just mean in Ireland, I, I, I mean in the, in the UK and other countries in Europe as well, just how little uh, collective knowledge there was about, about China, about its, its growing power, about its growing importance on, on the world stage. Um, and you do have to wonder, you know, where are the China experts? Where are the, chi the, the Chinese speakers? Where, where are the people who are, uh, you know, being brought up from a young age uh, to study this, this new reality and to understand it? I think we owe, um, you know, our own countries that, and we also owe it to the world to have a better grip on, on what's changed here. I think we're all kind of still living in, in the 20th century and this kind of Cold War uh, mentality. I think we're behind the times. Um, but another point on, on, on the media that Jamil raised there, um, this is so true. I mean, there's no money in our media, there's nothing. So I was the last Irish journalist uh, in China. There's nobody left anymore. Nobody can afford to set up a bureau in China. That it's expensive, you know, you need to put money behind it. You, you need a massive amount of funding. Papers in Ireland this year are lucky to stay afloat. They're lucky to have their, their uh, you know, their journalists in Ireland, let alone across the world. So th this again is a major uh, knowledge gap. It's going to affect uh, how Irish people understand China, it's going to uh, affect bilateral relations. It's hugely important. I think that's something that's, that really needs to be addressed as a, as a media ecosystem. You're like, what are we gonna do about China coverage? Because we don't have anybody uh, specifically for Ireland at the moment. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It needs more money, it needs more interest. Um, and I think it's really, really important. I, I'm not sure that uh, the government has, has, has really uh, begun to understand uh, how important the media is to this relationship as well. Finbar, would you like to come in here on the media yeah. or the ecosystem point? Yeah, I would sort of echo what Yvonne said, particularly about expertise. And it's, it's, it, you're right, it's not just, um, it's not just Ireland, it's Europe. Um, you know, I was warned when I moved from Hong Kong by a fairly prominent economist um, says to me, um, you know, you need to be careful when you move to, to uh, Brussels because everybody's going to want to talk to you about China, but nobody's going to know going to know what they're talking about. Um, so you've got a situation where there's a lot of interest in the topic and there really isn't the expertise to join the dots. Um, what you often get is, uh, in particularly in parts of Europe, is almost like repurposed Soviet Union experts giving their views on China, which is quite dangerous because it's not the same. Um, you know, they're very different beasts. Um, and, you know, when I speak with diplomats, um, particularly in Hong Kong, like when they were talking about, like, uh, even speaking to their, uh, you know, their home, their home uh, missions, whatever, in, in their capitals, even they were saying in their capitals, you know, that the, the people weren't listening to, to what they were saying, they were, they were fully getting overruled, or they didn't have the intelligence that they would have liked in their, in their, in their capitals. So it's not, it's not just in the, in the research world, it's also a government level, um, I would say a lack of China knowledge. But one thing I would say is, is, is maybe a, a warning is like, um, I don't know how you resolve this, but the last thing you want is like people just sort of um, because it's expedient to be a China expert and to be a China hawk and to be a China watcher. 
um, everybody these days seems to want to be seen as a China watcher. So you're seeing a lot of these sort of Johnny come lately um, who really don't know what they're they're on about. Um, you know, putting their hands up and writing op-eds and so on. And actually, you get a lot of this in the in the European Parliament as well. You know, because it's a it's a sort of bandwagon people jumping on it. But if you actually ask them a few questions about why do you feel this way? What is your sort of journey to get to this point on China? There's really nothing beneath the surface. Um, so I do agree with what Yvonne said about a lack of expertise in the, you know, uh, in the media, I think there's uh, focusing on the EU-China relationship. There's a handful of, of people here in Brussels. There's somebody in the UK that I know of. I think there's somebody in Frankfurt um, doing it as well, but it's also fairly um, nascent territory. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, how do, how do you encourage um, media to start hiring in this space? Uh, and, and it's telling actually that a lot of the people who are now covering China are doing it from outside of China. You know, I'm covering from the European point of view, but you've got um, people who can't get visas for China um, because of the sort of, uh, you know, crackdown on media uh, because of the pandemic and so on. This is at least the, the official uh, excuse who are having to cover it from overseas. Uh, I think you're seeing Bureau popping up in Washington um, that don't really have any intention on, of sending anyone to, to China. Um, I think this is generally quite dangerous and, you know, it's obviously largely the fault of the Chinese government. They complain about, uh, you know, the story, the narrative on China being so inaccurate, but then they're not prepared to allow journalists to actually do the work and report from within their borders. Like, so, it's it's not really good, I would say, for the for the world um, to have the biggest geopolitical story in, on on the planet and people reporting on it from afar and without the sort of requisite um, skills and without the resources. Um, so yeah, I would just have to have to echo what Yvonne said. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Fimber. Um, a couple of questions here for Jamil, touching on the same topic. One from Alex Dukolsky at UCD and one here from David O'Halloran, the brother of Richard O'Halloran. And this question, Jamil, you painted a very uh, grim picture of New Zealand's political relations with China. So what specific lessons do you think a state like Ireland can draw from the New Zealand experience? Uh, I would say, first of all, um, don't become overly reliant um, from a trade perspective on on any country, but um, but especially one that weaponizes trade uh, for political uses and for you know to punish countries for uh, uh, what it regards as political um, uh, mistakes. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, when you're looking at trade opportunities in Asia, there are lots of countries and lots of uh, countries that are not going to um, weaponize your trade against you. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't trade with China, you shouldn't invest if the opportunities are there, but just be aware as a company, as a country that, um, you know, there are very large risks involved. And many times as a company, the, those risks are out of your hands. Even as a government, uh, you look at the the case that Yvonne mentioned of uh, Liu Xiaobo and the and the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the the Norwegian government was really blindsided by that. I mean, uh, you, you you can have um, public figures, you can have media organisations in your country write something about Taiwan or the Dalai Lama, and that can um, uh, that can affect your state to state relations, and it can impact your um, your companies, and it can be completely outside of your your um, uh, own own remit, you know, or your own actions. So that's one thing. And then um, invest in expertise, invest in uh, people who um, who can uh, tell you what's really going on. And, you know, there are people, there aren't many in my country or your country, but, but there are some. And I remember about 10 years ago, my old professor, who is a China, uh, expert, I would say, um, he mentioned to me he'd recommended to the government of the day that they set up a special unit, just one or two people inside the prime minister's office to, with a bit of China literacy, a bit of China understanding, like that this is, you know, just as an advisor say, okay, well, here are the pitfalls or here, you know, it's just as a policy um, uh, shop inside the the you know highest levels of government and they laughed at him I mean, they thought it was ridiculous oh we know about China we sell them lots of milk it's awesome and so it's I, I think from the New Zealand experience 
you long before you are in a position where you are out of sync with your allies, where you're out of sync with your own public uh, as a government, get literate, get uh, some understanding. That would be my um, advice. Great, thank you, Jamil. We have a question here, which I will give to Tim first, and then if anyone else wants to come in on, um, please, you're more than welcome. But it, the topic is US state funded think tanks influence in Ireland China relations. So this is from Kiri Paramore. She is professor of Asian studies at University College Cork. And she says, in discussion of Ireland China relations over the past few months, the Irish public sphere has witnessed an unprecedented level of intervention from foreign foundations, notably those funded by the US government. Examples of such organizations which have hosted public events on China and Ireland in the past few months include the German Marshall Foundation, the Victims of Communism Memorial Fund, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Do panel members think it is appropriate for the US government to intercede through its funded think tanks in Ireland's relations with another country in the domestic public debates around it? And I think obviously as I'm sitting here in a US think tank, it is a uh, appropriate question to, to put to you. So Tim, if you'd like to start off. Um, yeah, some of those events I don't know about. Um, but I mean, one of our avenues to improve our expertise, and you know, you can see that the ecosystem that you're speaking of is not as deep or as broad as it might be in Ireland or other countries as it should be, is having events. Um, now, it's, it is notable that there is no Chinese representative on this panel today, but that's okay. Uh, the, the topic is what the topic is. Um, from our perspective, you know, in the department, it is good to have these conversations. We may not be very comfortable with some of the conversations, but it's good to have these conversations. Um, we receive inputs and documentation and reports and information and views from a huge range of sources. Um, it doesn't mean we value one over the other, uh, but it is important that the conversation that we're having today uh, is one that we have more frequently and that we use conversations like this um, with eyes wide open uh, to improve the ecosystem that we were just talking about in the last question. Would any other panelists like to come in on this point? If not, then um, we have another question, which I think Finbar and Jamil might be appropriate for you, which is the PRC has been pursuing its current approach to Xinjiang for over five years. Why is it that this approach has only become contentious in the last six months? So, uh, Finbar, if you'd like to take a stab at that first. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that it's been a lot longer than five years. Um, the, the persecution's been going on and this, these, this sort of cultural assimilation programs. Um, why has it only become known? Um, that's a good question. Um, I suppose that there's been serious leaks of documents and a lot more academic research going into it. You can trace a lot of these stories back to a sort of core of, um, of researchers who have, have sort of... Um, uh, very, very put, put, put the, the leg work in, and a lot of journalists have sort of then capitalized on this. Um, I mean, I, I've actually um, been taken aback by how how it sort of has become such a massive issue over the past 18 months. And that's not to say it shouldn't be such a massive issue, but it's just exploded. Um, when I speak with friends in Ireland, perhaps who wouldn't have known where Xinjiang was a year ago, they're now asking me about Uyghurs. Um, and you know, it's 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 it's. I think, uh, in part, because the wider situation with China has changed so much, there is so much sort of awareness now of China's, uh, of, you know, the perceived China threat. Um, China is an uh, authoritarian state. Uh, you've obviously got the fact that you know, speaking of megaphone diplomacy, the Trump administration really gave this um, a lot of of airtime uh, with sanctions, with um, crackdowns on uh, product bans, and like with withhold release orders on cotton from Xinjiang and so on. So uh, you know, it, it, it's the, the, the political issue of the day. Um, it's got to do with China. Um, you know, the Trump administration taking China to task very vocally has certainly gave, gave this a, a platform. Um, so, I mean, aside from, from, from that, um, no, I'm not quite sure if there's anything apart from the fact that it's a political issue, um, that it's very topical and that more people are generally interested in China, um, that this has become such a huge issue. Thanks, Jamil, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, sure. So. Um... 
actually the Financial Times was one of the first media to properly report on um, the uh, the new policies that were introduced in Xinjiang starting in 2017. So starting that year, um, that was when the um, the mass construction of these uh, detention centers, uh, re-education centers began, and when the real wave of mass incarceration began. So prior to that, I've been to Xinjiang about 20 times in my career, in my 20 years in China, and um, there have been times early on, the first time I went there was in uh, late 2020, uh, sorry, so late 2000, late 2000. Um, uh, so back then, late 2000, it was relatively um, free and it got freer for several years after that. And then uh, following the large pro uh, protests in 2009, where hundreds of people were killed, these, these sort of race riots in, um, in Urumqi and, and elsewhere, uh, the, the crackdown really began. And then um, you got more and more uh, terrorist activity as well. Um, I covered some of those uh, attacks um, as well as a reporter. Um, but it really wasn't until so so the situation there really started to get much worse after 2009 and then it it um it really deteriorated to the point where we are now in 2017 and what i try to do as a reporter i try to look at the uh the, the current policy of um the the communist party in xinjiang and think about you know what are the reasons for it uh does it make sense i try to put myself uh, as much as possible into the role of the policymakers. and the thing that strikes me about this policy is it is just so short-sighted if you if you were to create a policy that alienated the whole world and also created generation after generation of terrorists this would be the policy you choose it just sort of blows my mind that they that they look through like a set of policy suggestions and they're like oh that one that's got to be like the most short-sighted and stupidest policy in my opinion that you could come up with um but i think it, it speaks to the sort of great paranoia um in beijing amongst the the top leadership which is fed by a culture of sycophancy i think around the top levels of the communist party and fear and and um I think the reason why it's all come to light uh, now is because, you know, Xinjiang has been really locked down since 2017, since this mass, mass incarceration began. Uh, it was very hard for us to report in the early stages. It's very hard. I mean, Yvonne's in Taiwan because, uh, you know, her and her husband tried to cover the story properly, but you, you as a journalist, try to go near it and you are immediately detained and kicked out of the, the province and, you know, the autonomous region, as they call it. Um, I think it's, the what what we know about it is only the result of very courageous reporting um, by individual reporters by some news organizations by some researchers outside of china some people inside china um, who are you know think it is a terrible policy um, and you know horrific policy really and so establishing the facts is the first thing and in a place which is very hard to report on where a government is trying to deny that these facts even exist uh, and then um, you know it takes a while then for the sort of world to kind of wake up and then it takes a while for the world to respond and to come up with policies and to discuss so I think it's absolutely natural that um, for a place which is impossible to really really truly report on uh, and you know it it was not until we had some people on early release from some of these um, camps and then they were able to get out of the country that we sort of really got some of the first-hand accounts. So, I mean, that makes absolute, absolute sense to me. Sure. Thanks, Jamil. Thanks so much. Um, Yvonne, there's a question here that's been asked a number of times in different forums, and that's how does Ireland's relationship with China impact its relationship with the US? So are there concerns about um, the how Ireland manages relationship with the US vis-a-vis -vis China. And this is becoming more of an issue, I think. Um, there are multinational uh, companies who have their headquarters in Ireland. Um, it's been raised in that context, whether there is an issue with uh, Huawei being part of Ireland's uh, uh, you know, uh, network, when, when we have uh, so many American uh, companies headquartering there. And I know that there are uh, some people who, who think that is definitely an issue and um, is going to uh, come to a head at some point. Um, with regard to um, 
if you don't mind, Connor, can I just quickly go back to the previous question? Of course, of course. <laughs> um, uh, and I see there's a, there's one there's a, a question that's come in about uh, have any of you visited uh, Xinjiang and um, the my visit was last September so actually not that long ago. Um, in terms of like why it's been suddenly propelled in, into the into the into the forefront, I think uh, as Jamil says, you know the the media coverage is definitely part of it. You know, uh, having TV pictures out of out of Xinjiang puts it into into the public arena. Um, in a very prominent way, I think the how how closed it is, how journalists are uh, uh, constantly obstructed from doing their work there. Um, when you when you're able to show that uh, quite blatantly, that that has an impact on on audiences. Um, and I so so it's partly the, the like the, the Western media coverage, but more than that, I think it's been the the Chinese government's reaction to the Western media coverage that has, has kept it at the forefront of these international uh, debates. So um, as Jamil mentioned, lots of reporters have had to, had to leave China because the Chinese government is so angry over their Xinjiang reporting. Uh, first, they tried to deny that the, the camps exist, existed. Uh, then when they admitted they existed, they pretended um, that they weren't t uh, t about, you know, the rounding people up. Uh, because of their religion or their ethnic minority, simply to re-educate um, and set about in a very deliberate way trying to delegitimize um, the Western media reports and the, the researchers uh, who had um, brought information to light about what's going on there. And I think that that reaction has really helped to perpetuate uh, people's interest in, in this topic. Um, I didn't answer the question very well on, on the American issue. Maybe somebody else can, can answer that. Sure, yeah, we are unfortunately approaching time. We've got a lot more um, very good questions here, which I'm afraid we will not get to all of them. If anyone would like to come in on the, Tim, if you, would you have anything to say on the American point? Um, not so much, only maybe to reiterate a little bit what I said earlier, that if you go back a little bit in time, I think there's a motif here across all the contributions made is that things are moving faster now in relation to Ireland, China <clears throat> than before. But if you go back a bit in time, Ireland-China relations were Ireland-China relations, a uh, bit of EU-China relations. But now China has come um, to be as strong as it is, and it, it is, it is uh, being dealt with now in Ireland's relations with everybody else. So absolutely, uh, Ireland-US relations uh, will have a Chinese dimension to it uh, that it may, may not have had five years ago or even three years ago. Uh, how that pans out is, is a matter for, for working out. Uh, but that's where it's at. Thank you very much, Tim. And yes, I'm afraid, unfortunately, we're just about to come up to time. So to finish off, uh, I'd like to go through the panel one more time so people can give just one minute of last thoughts. But guided by the question of, we, we made the point that there's very much an inaugural conversation on this topic and that, you know, building the ecosystem, building, um, bring this conversation forward is very important. So if panelists could give their view on where they think the conversation on China and Ireland should go. Um, to close it out, that'd be great. Uh, we'll go in reverse order. So Finbar, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, um, I'll just really quickly say on the, and it sort of brings in that last question about um, the US. Um, I think Ireland sort of um, may be in a situation where, you know, the US and the EU are both going down a different route that with, with China than maybe uh, would be liked, maybe not the same balanced relationship that has been pursued. Um, with the case of the Biden administration, when I speak with uh, European officials, they certainly say that he's harder to say no to on China than Trump was. Um, you know, Trump was obviously very hard line, but he wasn't multilateral. He didn't have that same engaging rhetoric. So I think um, what we might see is that Ireland is sort of um, <laughs> pulled along by changing policies uh, in the, the two superpowers in the West, essentially um, the United States and the European Union. Um, as for where it should go, I mean, I'm not really, not really my place to comment on that, but, but I do certainly feel, feel like the global geopolitical situation will, will change to such an extent that, that Ireland may be forced to change along with it. Great, thanks, Zimbar. Gmail? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean my only uh, contribution would be to say that you should have more uh, discussions, and I, I think um, you know, should uh, it's good that you're raising this issue for an Irish audience. Um, I think what one of the uh, participants, the point that one of the participants made about uh, this being organised by the Wilson Centre uh, is is somewhat valid. I think that you know Ireland should be having this conversation with Irish people. Um, with Irish people of Chinese descent and with, uh, you know, some of the diaspora community and, but also, um, you know, really uh, paying attention to this because obviously China now impacts everywhere and everyone. So uh, it's good that you're doing this and I hope you can do more and do more once you're back in Ireland as well. Thank you, Jerome. Um, Yvonne? Yeah, I think, um... I think that's a really important point. I think having these these conversations and bringing in the the, the Chinese um, diaspora in particular, I think is is essential. I think uh, one of my biggest regrets, uh, having left China, is losing that uh, human connection. I think that's really important in um, in in trying to report this really important country. And uh, I think that the more we can have of that. Um, you know, the better relations will be. Um, so the more discussions, the more, you know, people to people exchange that, that we can have, um, I think is better for everybody, it's better for Ireland and it, it's better for bilateral relations and, and better for the global community as a, as a whole. And, and just to reiterate the earlier point of, of engendering that China expertise in each of our societies is really important, but that has to start quite early on. Uh, you know, at a school level where, where people are uh, encouraged to be interested in China and I hope to see more of that. Great, thank you, Yvonne. And finally to Tim. Yeah, I think Yvonne might have been reading my notes, um, but echo everything she says. I mean, this may be, the, it's not the first conversation, but it's the first conversation sometime uh, in this topic and maybe with this degree of uh, seriousness. Um, we gotta keep it going. Um, you know, we're always interested in talking to people who have something interesting to say. Um, so keep this conversation going with various stakeholders around the place, including those uh, from the Chinese side, and keep developing that understanding, uh, and keep growing that ecosystem, developing that understanding, um, and keep watching, keep keep communicating, uh, keep bringing in interesting speakers from far ends of the world. Thanks. Great, thank you, Tim, and thank you to all our panelists. I'm looking forward personally to continuing to be part of this conversation as it moves forward. And um, thank you particularly to Yvonne and Jamil. I know it's very late over there now, so I, we appreciate you staying up. And thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us today. I will hand over now to Nathan Hill, the director of the Asian Studies Center at Trinity to just uh, say closing remarks. Yes, so um, uh, thank, I'd like to thank all the panelists and everyone for coming and uh, in, in effect, uh, just uh, pick up on this point that uh, continuing conversation and developing expertise in, in about China in Ireland is important. Uh, and uh, with that, I would just like to, to, to make uh, members of the audience aware specifically that on the 22nd of September, we'll be having a, a, another uh, panel discussion about the use of internment as a technique of governance uh, that will include a, a discussion of uh, what we've been seeing in uh, Xinjiang, but also uh, other historical and uh, geographical examples. And also uh, throughout uh, the Michaelmas uh, 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 term, we will be having uh, uh, some talks about uh, the history and current developments of uh, minority nationalities policy uh, in the PRC. And then in the spring, uh, things about uh, uh, the history of, uh, of communism in East Asia and uh, specifically uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party. So um, hopefully if you've enjoyed some of the things, uh, the, the discussion today and uh, feel like you uh, agree that a, an ongoing discussion about uh, China and its policies uh, is important that you'll join us for some of those events as well. So uh, that's all uh, from me and uh, uh, just uh, maybe end once more by uh, thanking everyone for coming and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this afternoon or this evening's depending on where you are uh, discussion.